All right, it is so good to see everyone this morning. The punctuality was fantastic. Man, I was, I thought, I, I thought this morning, am I late or something? <laughs> what is going on? I thought, yeah, how great is that? Um, amen. Um, I, I guess bribery with coffee helps. I guess that's what happens. Uh, no, it's all about the heart, amen? You know, um, what I was shocked about this morning is when uh, Doug and Monique were up here sharing, I thought it was his daughter. <laughs> and I thought for a moment there, I said, wow, what a great father and daughter moment we have up here. And, and, and I was just blown away that that was his wife. <laughs> oh, man, it is so good to be with you guys. Um, we're about to embark on a 10-part series, Epic Battles in the Scriptures. Of course, for the first few weeks, uh, since Melly and I have been here, we had a chance to focus on how great our God is and really to keep our eyes fixed on Him and to realize that that's where everything starts. That's the foundation. That's why we do things. And then as we will look on the epic battles and to realize the victory that is found in God. And so that was the intention. And then I came up this morning with lions, bears, and giants, and I figured I was going to talk about the teams that did not make the playoffs in the NFL this year. <laughs> the lions, the bears, and the tigers. Oh, man, it is so great to be here. Uh, I am, I, I've got to... I will be remiss not to mention a, a great family that is a, f that's part of the Singh family. Uh, that is the, the Clark family, Donna and Denzel and Megan, they're all here. They drove up, I think they came the farthest this morning. This morning, they left their home in the Toronto area, drove up, came here, and uh, just to be with the congregation here, it is so great to be with you guys. Uh, and, um, that's certainly always so encouraging. And so one of the things that I said that we were going to do, uh, that we're going to be a congregation that is very thoughtful about what we do. And uh, that we're not just doing things with emotions, while emotions are remarkably important. But it's important that we worship God not only with our, with our heart, but also with our minds. And so one of the things that we're going to do for this epic series is that we're going to give you the scriptures beforehand, at least to form a framework of what we're going to be talking about uh, this Sunday morning. And so we, I gave you the scriptures that will come to you, by the way, uh, sometimes either uh, by me on Sunday mornings or uh, through the newsletter, okay? And so uh, pay attention to that. I want to encourage you, next week's sermon uh, will be found in Daniel chapter 1 through 3. And so if you want to do some, uh, uh, some preparatory work, if you would, to come in, and I think you'll get a little bit more out of the sermon. And in this day in technolo uh, of technology, we can actually send a lot of things before that you come in well prepared so that you can even get a little bit more. And then afterwards, you can go back and even check some more what is going on. Amen? Amen. Today, we're going to be talking about lions, bears, and giants. Of course, uh, any Bible study will tell us that is talking about David and, and the way that uh, he went about his life. And so before we get to David, though, I want to form a framework of how did we get to David. Of course, we know that the Israelites uh, were in Egypt and for 400 years that they were uh, in captivity. And then uh, there was a man by the name of Moses who came to, uh, to lead them out of the land of captivity. And of course, initially he thought that he was going to slay an Egyptian and everybody was going to rally to him and realize we are going to be rescued by this incredible person, only to find out that the people were actually were thinking, are you going to slay us as you slew the Egyptian? And he was banished uh, for 40 years into the desert. And at the age of 80, God came to him and said, I am going to use you to lead the people out of Egypt. And Moses thought God was nuts. Ultimately, he surrendered to God, went back to Egypt, 
and uh, we have one of the most epic showdowns, which we're going to look at, amen, another time, Moses and the Pharaoh. Ultimately, after 10 plagues, uh, the, the, the Pharaoh said, okay, I'll get out of here, leave, um, and, and, and we realized the, the uh, Israelites left Egypt uh, and then wandered in the desert for about 40 years. And one of the reasons they had to wander in the desert is that they, while they were living in Egypt, they lost perspective on who the Lord God Almighty was. And there was a cleansing of real proportions that needed to take place, both in their hearts and even of the people. And, they, and we realized that Moses, as great of a leader as he was, as a matter of fact, the scripture describes him as there was never a leader of God's people like Moses before or since. And yet Moses was not allowed to enter the land flowing with milk and honey, God's promised land. As a matter of fact, when he was about to enter the land, he did not do what God wanted him to do. He lost his temper, struck the rock, and God says, you shall not enter my land flowing with milk and honey. And Moses was brought to Mount Nebo, and he looked over, and he saw the land flowing with milk and honey, and yet he was not allowed to enter it. Sobering thing. We'll talk about, about, about that another time. Then uh, uh, one of his aides, one of his assistants, Joshua, came up, and Joshua started leading uh, the people of God, and he led them into the land flowing with milk and honey. One of the great stories and metaphors that is found in, about God's people was at this time, even though the Israelites were in the right land, shall I say, the right place, they were not doing the right things. And sometimes what we've got to understand, church membership is not what qualifies us for a great relationship with God. Because they were in the right place. And yet, it was a colossal mess. So much of a mess that God brought about judges, leaders, for the next 325 years. And the people of God went through cycles of momentary repentance and then falling back into disrepute in regard to their God and was worshiping different gods. And so for 325 years, the judges led. And ultimately, we'll look at some of those judges in our epic battles, Samson being one of them. Amen? And so we'll go through this. And so my, my goal as we talk about this is that you're going to get grounded a little bit more in the overview of what this is all about, how this is woven through the scriptures, that God, that there is a method to this madness, and, and, and that these are not just crazy stories, but they're woven together by one author, and that is God. And yet we realize, okay, so in the, in the day of the book of Judges, we had about 12 judges. And then the people said, no, wait a minute. We are going up and down, and we want a king. And so we pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Samuel was, became one of the, um, the prophets, one of the judges, uh, could be also uh, described. And so it was at this time that we read about a very interesting time in God's history. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, in verse 6, the people of God said, we want to be like the other nations around us. We too want a king. And in verse 6, but when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel so he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. And so here, in a simple verse, we find one of the most sad description of the state of God's people. And they asked for a king. And of course, we know that that's when Samuel, 
anointed Saul as Israel's first king. Correction, Israel's second king. A lot of time people answer this question. Sam, Saul was Israel's first human king. Israel's first king was, was God. And they rejected God as their king. And they wanted a human king. And God warned them that what was that going to be like. And yet they still said, no, we want to be just like the people around us. We want to be just like our neighbors. A familiar refrain even for us today, sometimes in our quest and what we want. Listen, people haven't changed that much. And so they too wanted their king. Can you not feel God's heart when he said, these people have rejected me as their king? And so in, in chapter 15, we read about what eventually happens to Samuel and Saul. Saul was given a charge. He had routed many of the enemies around them. Just so that you know, when, uh, when Joshua went back into the land flown of milk and honey, Canaan, the, land, the promised land, right? There were still some resistance, if you would, that were there, um, so that there needed to be some getting rid of some of these of God's enemies. And that continued for many, many years. And Saul became their king and routed many, many um, enemies. He became a very powerful king. And so Saul was asked by God to do something. And then the Bible says in chapter 15 and verse 10, Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. What a phrase. I regret that I have made Saul king. I never want God to say that. I regret that I have made Tori one of my ambassadors, one of my children, a servant of mine. And yet a more sobering statement about someone and their relationship with God could not be made. See, what happened was God asked him to destroy the enemy completely. And Saul figured, hey, God, I know that's what you said, but what you really meant was... And so what he did has a reasonability to it, has some human wisdom to it. And so what he did was he said, I am going to keep the, the best animals so I can use them for sacrifice. I'm going to save some of the people, the king specifically, so that the people can see that, yes, we have subjected our enemies. And so he figured that he was not going to, that he was going to modernize, that he was going to interpret what God said, because God didn't probably quite understand what was going on in this day and age. There are times that we try to rework the words of God, and we think, Man, does, does God really understand our times? As our, our times have become so modern, and this was printed fifth, in the 15th century. It was written many, many years before. And do, are we really understanding? And yet we make that same mistake over and over and over and over again. You do, and I do. And God said about Saul, I reject you as the king 
of my people. And so what happens was then a new king was going to be chosen. And this king was described as a man after God's own heart. And of course, in Samuel, the next chapter in verse 16, we see that Samuel was about to anoint David. And this is what it says in chapter 16 in verse 7. As Samuel was looking at who he was going to appoint, interestingly, God did not say exactly to Samuel what he what this person's name was and uh, who he was going to be. I don't understand all of that. Maybe to keep Samuel hum so humble, to realize, listen, you don't know everything. You just need to follow what I'm going to tell you. I, I don't know, but th that's conjecture. I don't know. I'll ask God when I see him. Uh, I, God, how, 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 tell me about this story. Nonetheless, we pick it up Sam in, in chapter uh, 16 and verse, um, let's start in 5. Samuel replied, um, yes, in peace, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And the whole idea of consecration, hopefully we know what that is. That's a, that's a real religious word, but we need to understand. It means it's when we take a time to separate ourselves and we dedicate ourselves to God in a spiritual slash religious manner for a special purpose, okay? And so there's, there are times that we're gonna have consecration. There are times even personally we should have consecrations and then uh, prayerfully we're gonna talk about this uh, on Easter Sunday when, they, when we have the most epic battle of them all, that we're gonna have a time of a consecration as a, con as a congregation together as we give ourselves and we're saying, God, we're consecrating ourselves to you. And so, it says, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stand here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. Amen. God says, ultimately... that our heart is what matters. It's not our appearance. If it was certainly our appearance, then Granville will not even be a disciple of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Just tell the truth, brother. Just the truth. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry about calling you out in public like that, but... Uh, it is what it is, you know. <laughs> it's not by our appearance. It's our heart. And then we see in verse 13 what happens. He goes through and, and, and he thought, surely. And he was, a, he was a spiritual man. Did he not understand this concept? But apparently he didn't. He goes through the oldest brother, then the second oldest brother, then the third oldest brother. And then he goes through all of them and says... He came to David, and God says, this is the one. Interestingly, in verse 13, he says, So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. From that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David, and Samuel went to Ramah. And so we see that here, David is anointed king. And what happens next? is truly, truly remarkable. Note to self and to the Ottawa Church of Christ. Samuel was anointed not once, not twice, but three times. Second Samuel 2, Sam, Second Samuel 5, we may turn to them, depends how this spirit leads, amen. We'll see what happens there. But we're gonna talk about this and the story in this epic battle and so, then David went back to shepherding his sheep. I don't understand all of it. I tried to do the chronology of it and because I was asking myself, as the story of David and Goliath came, 
Was this after his announcement or before his announcement? And I realized as I was reading the scriptures more and more, David was actually anointed three times. And we will understand in a few mo moments what this is all about. And when I read the story of David and Goliath talking about lions, bears, and tigers, and we'll look at it in it for a second. And so it says in chapter 17 and verse 4, there was the enemies of the Israelites, the Philistines, and then there were the people of God. In between was a valley. And the Bible tells us for 40 days, this guy who is massive, some translation have him at seven feet, some have it at nine feet. The point remains, he was massive. When I did the math, I figured he was nine feet because his armor bearer alone was indisputable in terms of even all the translations. It was 125 pounds. I mean, you have to be massive for you just to have that aspect, that armor on you just to be 125 pounds and walk around that with some degree of comfort. Nonetheless, so for 40 days, this champion slash mediator, and we'll talk about that in a few moments, came and taunted the armies of Israel. We pick it up in verse 4. It says, a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was about six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron po uh, point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went on ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will come and become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine says, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. And so for 40 days, the Bible tells us, in the morning and the evening, he came with the same refrain. And he taunted God's army, the Israelites. And of course, one day, Jesse, the boy's father, three of whom Jesse's brothers were, were on the front line, front line in the battles. He said, I, I need to know how my boys are doing. And so he sends him some food and, and he says, go and tell him and bring back a report as to how they were doing. And we know the story. We know the story that this man was, an, uh, this man was taunting the, the, the Israelites. And what happened was Je uh, David, the son of Jesse, heard this taunting. And, he, and he's, he's miffed. He's puzzled. Who is this person that now is just taunting us we pick, it, we pick it up in verse 28. And so we side. Actually, let's start in verse 26. David asks the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Interestingly, David was the first one at this point in time who addressed the armies as the armies of the living God as opposed to the armies of the Israelites. It's interesting when you see things in a spiritual manner. And so he says, 
They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. A whole bunch of stuff will be given to him. Then Eliab, David's older brother, heard him speaking with the men. He burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are. I know how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. David said, oh, What did I do? Can I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter, and then the man answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, You are not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Man. He said, Saul, you can't talk me out of this. I don't care how big he is. I don't care how trained he is. He's defying God's army, God's people is being put to shame and it stirs my heart it moves me it matters I can't simply stand and watch and do nothing What does the reputation of God mean to you? God's name being lifted up in Ottawa, does that matter to you? Or are we going to cover in fear? And I don't know what the Philistine, the armies of Israel was their battle plan. But every day they just stood there and the guy came down and taunted them. Saul dressed David in his own tunic, put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around, but he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, choose, chose five smooth stones from the stream, then put them in his pouch of his shepherd's bag, and he sling it in his hand, approach, and the sling in his hand approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was a little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome. I'm not saying anything about Owen at this point in time, like nothing about it. <laughs> and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come with me, come with me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, I give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied this day. The Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those who gather hail will know that, there's, that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into her hands. And as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching out into his bag, taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell 
face on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran over, stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from its sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran, and we know what happens. Incredible. And we see what happens here is a monumental story. Lions, bears, and giants. They met the same fate when they came upon the shepherd boy named David. But this story, church, is not about a giant and a lion and a bear. This story is the gospel message. You will find woven in the Old Testament all these stories that are written are ultimately the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And that all these authors wrote these stories with one thing in mind, not that they understood it, but the author, the ultimate author understood it, that it pointed to the Christ. And we see David as a type of Christ. And the whole situation, we read about how Saul, when he was anointed, he was only anointed with a flask of oil, a small part. When David was anointed, he was anointed with a full horn of oil. Not once, not twice, but three times. Symbolic of the, of the idea that Christ, the spirit of Christ, and the spirit that was in Christ, rather, was without limit. That it was not just a portion that was given to him. And to realize that these stories that are being told from the time that David was anointed, was talking about when Christ indeed was anointed. Did the 40 days sound familiar? When he was being taunted, as when he went into the desert for 40 days, and he championed Goliath, and, he, and as Satan himself came, and he defeated Goliath, not with a sword, but rather with the Spirit of the Lord. For the battle is the Lord. And we realize throughout the scriptures that David, like Jesus, was sent from his father by his father, Jesse. And that he was sent out and this, this champion, Satan, came up. And Jesus defeated him with one arm. I was portrayed and, uh, and prophesied about how one arm of the Lord was going to defeat his enemies. And he picked up a slingshot. He wasn't going to miss. And with one arm, and while it was an epic battle of sorts, when God fights on our side, it really is not a contest at all. And how Jesus did not use a sword. David did not use a sword. As a matter of fact, one of the Jesus' disciples was about to use a sword one time, and Jesus says, what are you doing, Peter? Why are you, why are you using a sword? Don't you know if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword? And we see the cross that was used to slay Jesus Christ, that was used to kill him, that was meant for his annihilation. The very thing that's, that Goliath used, which was the sword, he thought he was going to come and use that sword to kill David. That very thing that was intended to annihilate Jesus Christ, that sword, so to speak, in the cross, was used to annihilate Satan the imagery is stark. This is the gospel message of Jesus Christ. 
foreshadowed in about what Satan did and how he lived his life. The, the mercy with which he treated the other people and how he was rejected by his very own, just as Christ was rejected by his very own. This type, anti-type, that is found in the scriptures of where it ultimately, and I tell you, all the Old Testament and all its stories, its purpose is to ultimately point into Christ and to tell us how Christ ultimately has won all the victories. Or do I need to tell you about when David will ask, hey, so what's going to be given for the person who kills it? A bride, which is the church, the bride of Christ that has been given. And the type, anti-type, and the imagery, and the gospel message found in this story is over and over again. And I challenge you to go back and read it and look at what the Christ has, how he has been represented in the slaying of this lion, this bear, and this tiger. And, and this giant, we got to understand here that Jesus, when he defeated his enemy, when they tried to taunt, when they, try, when they rejected, that did not thwart him. And so I, I challenge you, church, to go ahead. I don't have time to go through all how this message of David and Goliath. Yes, it's about David and Goliath, but it's ultimately, it's about the triumph of Christ over Satan. As so Monique so eloquently shared about the way Christ defeats the battles even outwardly and sometimes even inwardly. So there's that message that is found in David and Goliath. It's not a story that we merely tell to our children in children's ministry class. I mean, that's cool and everything, but it's real message is found in the ultimate message of the cross and of Jesus Christ. And it's stories like this when I read and I understand the scriptures and I see it woven throughout the Old Testament that all these things point to the Christ ultimately. And all of them were a faint image of him and how the ultimate victory and the ultimate person was found in Christ. How could David be a man after God's own heart when you realize what he did? Yet his desire for repentance and the desire to please the Lord was absolutely unrivaled when you read the Psalms or when you read about the life of David and you realize, man, I don't have to be perfect in order for me to be a vessel for which God can use. One of the things some images and some examples that David need, also needs to teach us. I don't have to, I'm not going to talk anymore about the type, anti-type, uh, uh, because it's full. I, I, I challenge you to go back and look at it, and you will see it with new eyes. Oh, my goodness. But David, one of the things we realize that David was anointed. He had the Spirit of God before he even went out. You know, it's interesting, as I looked at this and, I, and as I read it, am I doing some, uh, Alex, am I doing some bad, you, as usual? He usually yells. Can you guys hear? I know you, oh, there we go. Awesome. David, as he went on this incredible, enormous task, he was anointed. As he continued to do the task of the Lord, he was anointed by his brothers, in front of his brothers, by the elders, and by his fellow warriors on a number of occasions. Interestingly, as I was reading the scripture as well, and I realized that even Jesus needed to be anointed with the Spirit before he actually went out to 
do battle. He waited 30 years. The apostles needed, needed to wait in Jerusalem to be anointed with the Spirit. And yet there are times, if you're anything like me, I try to fight these battles on my own. And I get a bruised head, a twisted ankle, and a bent and twisted arm. And like an idiot, go back and hit, bang my head on that wall again. Ottawa Church, as we embark on this mission that Christ has given us, if we try to do it in our own strength, it is a mission that is bound to fail. Failure, it's its only destination. But if David needed an anointment time after time after time, if the Christ needed an anointment before he could do battle with Satan and to do his mission on earth, how about us? Or oh, to go forward in our workplace, in our endeavors at school, as we spread the message of Jesus Christ, if we were to do it on our own, it was bound to fail. If we were to have the Spirit of God, what can God do with these disciples that have empowered themselves with the Spirit of God? You see, we have got to do this with the Spirit. Now, when the Spirit, when we're led by the Spirit, it's not this feeling, okay? We're going to understand it. But here's, some, here's something that I'm going to say some wild and crazy here, okay? Even if sometimes your church leader doesn't think that you need to do what needs to go on, and yet you are driven, and you know that you're driven by the Spirit of God, not by some ego, but by the Spirit of God. That even though wise counsel is a good thing, sometimes it's not what's needed. So let me ask you, as we ask for God's leading, Sometimes it's going to mean doing something even when the people around you are going to think you're nuts, crazy, and have lost your mind. Now that's a, that's a dangerous thing to say. Because you know as a church leader, I like control. <laughs> when to do it, how to do it, if to do it, and how high to jump, or just like, I mean... But we know if we're going to be a church that's led by God's Spirit, Amen. we need some people who have the Spirit of God that just embroils in their heart and passion. I don't want to live your Christian life for you. I don't want you to learn everything you learn about God from me. I want it to be a small fraction. I, I must confess to you, that's not the way I was before when I was a leader. Some of you have laughed a little too hard about that. And it's hurting my feelings right now. And the rest of you are saying, amen, what is going on? But the idea here, of course, seriously, is that this this task that we're doing is Goliath-like. And if we're going to defeat Goliath in our own strength and in our own power, we've lost our ever-loving mind. That there are things about David that he was not going to be controlled by what other people thought of him. He was not going to be controlled by his reputation per se. But it's interesting. 
as he did the work of the Lord, and then the refrain came afterwards, Saul has slain thousands, David has slain tens of thousands. As a matter of fact, his reputation, when he didn't care about people's reputation of him, it grew and grew and grew. And its impact was even greater. I can't wait when we are a church that just responds to the Spirit of God. And we are just nuts about our faith. You know, David picked up five stones with one arm, as we shared about, and he slung it, and he killed the Goliath. You know what he did? He made sure that the Goliath was dead. We got to finish the work. You know, sometimes what that means for us, honestly, when we're helping people to become Christians, is that we just not only help them to become Christians, but we nurture them and we, we have them be rooted deep in the faith so that when the winds and the waves come, we have completed our work. Yeah. That there was no chance of revival of Goliath when he was slain. that are soldiers of Christ, that we would not leave this work unfinished. Man, when we were singing that song, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, I was convicted. <laughs> the lyrics are awesome. They're encouraging and awesome. I pray you pay attention to the lyrics of the songs. And so, we see in David this idea of how we can imitate what he ultimately did. That he was a man so filled with the Spirit and we find that the victories of David was enormous. And yet he was, a not, he was not a man that was perfect. He committed adultery. He killed one of his best friends. He had concubines and hundreds of wives. Now, that is not giving us license to do that. We will miss the entire story if that were the case. But I want you to, I want to leave you with this thought. With one arm, he defeated the enemy. If we let this battle be the Lord's, you will be, rem you will be surprised and encouraged as to how indeed this victory can be ours after we walk in the spirit of the Lord. And so this idea about the lions, tigers, and giants, they're nothing. This victory ultimately is the Lord's and we're gonna go and embark on these epic battles and we will see Christ in all of them, Amen. in every single one of them. While they were a standalone great story, we will see Christ in all of them. This begin our 10-part series on the epic battles in the scriptures. Today was about lions, bears, and giants. Next week, we're going to talk about fires and all that kind of stuff, okay? Some wildfires. Uh, at this time, we'll have Rob come up. Uh, Rob is going to lead our thoughts as we collect our weekly contribution. Thank you so much, Rob. <laughs>